I love talking about technology, but technology without being informed by a story is not meaningful. And I was talking with Norman as he and I were chatting about this event, and Norman looks even more exhausted today than usual. Hmm. But he has a Thank good you. reason for it. And it's absolutely relevant to what we're going to be talking about for the next 40 minutes. So, Norman, why do you look so tired? Because I'm old. Uh, <clears throat> no, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to do this without sounding like a complete dick. But that um, I spent today at uh, Google's offices, uh, USC and in five other schools are doing a project around glass. And uh, we are shooting and constructing stories in glass. And there are a lot of tech people there and a lot of glass filmmakers and a lot of people from Google. And one thing that they said, every single one of them said, is, uh, yeah, you know what we really could use help on is telling stories. Right? We really kind of know how to get the, I almost said a word I probably shouldn't say in public, to get this magnificent material we recorded and it goes into the, the temple of your glass and we know how to get it uh, out on the web and we know how to get it into our NLEs, but we just aren't so good at telling stories. So that's why we were there. Which leads into what we want to do. Rather than talk about technology, what we want to do is talk about the craft of storytelling. And we're going to do this in two ways. I want to do a simple example to sort of set the scene. And then we're going to deconstruct a particular scene from a, a movie that Norman worked with. Mm -hmm. So wait, where, where did this stuff come from, though? I'm about to explain yeah, that. There we go. This is how we work together. This is, and you're about to find out when we work together. The last time Norman and I worked together was three and a half years ago, and you'll understand why in about another five minutes. <laughs> this is a scene from a podcast that Norman and I do together called Two Real Guys, which, by the way, launched its brand new website at 645 today because I told the webmasters if it isn't on in time for tonight, everybody's fired. So they are all employed, and the new website is launched. It's the number two, R-E-E-L-G-U-Y-S, tworealguys.com. It's film school in a box. It's everything you want to know about filmmaking, except what buttons to push. We'll talk about how to craft a story, problems with directors, how to coach actors, working with dancers, working with choreographers, working with costumers, staging a fight scene, staging a comedy, how you set comedy up versus set drama up, directing actors for dramatic moments. It's everything you want to know except what buttons to push. Right. In fact, can I break in here, Larry? Have you all not already <laughs> done so? That's right. This is how we work together. Um, so the pitch line for Two Real Guys, and uh, the second season just launched last week, um, the pitch initially for the first season was there's plenty of podcasts out there which tell you how to push the buttons. And one of the best proponents and one of the best uh, examples of that are the things that Larry does. Uh, this would be a time for applause. There you go. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, but there is, you see, I'll shill for you. <laughs> uh, but there's nothing out there that will talk about why you would push those buttons. And that's two real guys. So we hired a bunch of actors and put together the two real players, and we used them to illustrate the concepts that Norman wrote about in his book called The Lean Forward Moment, which you'll hear more about in just a minute. By the way, Norman's written at least two books that are readable. One is The, uh, the Lean Forward Moment, which is, should be read by every editor. And the other is The Film Editor's Handbook, which should be read by anybody that wants to be an editor. They're both excellent, and they've both Thank gone you. through multiple revisions, and he's finally got it into English so the rest of us can understand right. it. I tried English initially, but now we finally got it there. In this scene, I want you to watch this scene. I'm going to show you two different versions of it. I'm not going to tell the difference yet because I don't want to trigger that, but think of this not in terms of the fact it's Final Cut 10 because I could do the same thing in Premiere, Final Cut 3, Final Cut 1 on a moviola. It makes no difference. I want you to look at the emotional response to this scene. It's silent. There's no audio. Okay. 
Danielle, let's watch it again. That was really meaningful. So Danielle comes out, and we're wondering what the heck is going on. And it's a dead body. Now, watch the exact same shots, but in a different order. In the first scene, Danielle sees what's happened before the audience does. So as soon as she reacts, the first thought that goes through her mind is, what is she doing? In the second scene, we see what happens before Danielle does. So we see the dead body. And then we say, well, now that we know there's a dead body, what's Danielle going to do? Exactly the same shots, in almost exactly the same order, but with a different trim and yet totally different emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I'm about to ask you to do a third version. It'll be easy, you'll be able to do it. Okay. Could you just take uh, maybe about 10 frames off the first shot of Danielle at the tail? Uh, no, right over here. That's the second, oh, you mean in the second scene? Right, the first shot of the second okay. scene. So she does not look down. Okay. Uh, maybe another 10, let's go back to before she looks down. Oh, you want to trim back before she yeah. looks down? Okay. By the way, for those of you doing technology, if you have an edit point selected, you type in a negative number and it moves the selected edit point by the number of time code frames you type in, and you can trim with shift and comma, and you can do, uh, sorry, comma and period, and you do shift comma, which is 10 frames, and shift period, which is 10 frames. So I'll just get back to where Norman wants to be. Right, my head just exploded because we were talking tech. You ready? <laughs> Here it is. Amazing. Right, so these are the same shots, placed in a different order. We're going to talk to incredibly simple, stupid concepts, right? So I'm going to apologize for that right now. Um, but that um, the difference between those two is not the shots, because the shots are exactly the same. Right? The difference is the order of the shots and the placement and uh, you saw the difference that uh, 20 frames made, or whatever it was that we took out there. Um, so, in fact, Danielle, in the second version, did not know what we know. Right? There's a potential third version there where we start with the dead body and let Danielle walk across. And, in fact, in that version, every step she takes is informed by the fact that we know she's about to walk into a dead body, see a dead body, and um, she doesn't. Right, so these two or three, or there's probably a hundred versions, but we have limited amounts of time tonight. Um, uh, there, there's so many different potential versions of this, each which will give the audience a different feeling. And I think, and Larry and I have had our arguments about this, I, I think that our job as filmmakers and our job as editors is to manipulate the audience to feel how we want them to feel. Larry doesn't like that word, manipulate. No, right? I don't. I would like the word guide, however. Our job mm -hmm. is to guide the audience so they achieve the conclusion we want them to achieve. Mm -hmm. But we are not just simply throwing shots up there. We know, just advertising studies have shown that we can control exactly where the eye looks in a frame. We know that if you put a person in a shot, the first place we look is their eyes. And then after that, we can pretty well predict the next three places they're going to look throughout the frame. And we can also tell where the eye goes first by that which is moving, or that which is bigger, or that which is brighter, or that which is in focus, or that which is in front, or that which is indifferent. And there's a stacking order of those six things that I can determine exactly where you're going to look, exactly mm -hmm. when you're going to look as I put a shot into the scene. And that I call controlling how the audience sees your movie. Actually, I call it manipulation. but. I don't want to upset Larry. I'm, I'm not as old. <laughs> <clears throat> no one's as old as me. Right? <laughs> uh, so our job is to get the response we want from the audience, right? Because those of you here who don't care how the audience perceives your material and whether they get your story or not, I invite you to, well, maybe not raise your hand, but walk out, leave. Because that's not our jobs. Our jobs are to help convey something, whether you're selling toothpaste, selling an emotional story, or any concept at all. 
At one of the classes that I teach at USC, one of the big challenges I have for the students who are not film students, I don't work in the August institution that, that Norman does, I'm just a mere... Right, but yet you have a chair. <clears throat> uh, yes, and mine has all four legs as opposed to yours. And the, but I teach students who are general run-of-the-mill USC students, and I teach visual literacy. Wait, could you say that thing again about the, the legs of the chair? Just shut up. So... <laughs> That's timing brothers and sisters, that is timing. We'll come back to that later. And one of the challenges that we have is it's very hard for people to actually see what's in front of their face. It's very hard to, you see what you expect to see, but you don't see what's actually there. And one of our challenges is to make sure that people see what we want them to see and not what they expect to see. Which gets to a movie that I wanted to talk about. Can you right. set the movie up? Yeah, sure, before we do that though, you know me, I'm a professor, so I talk a lot. I want to introduce one more concept here. Right? And normally I stand up and walk around when I say that, but Dean will kill me. So what's the first concept you've already introduced? So the first concept that we've seen now is what I call the rule of threes. The rule of threes is basically that the impact of a shot is completely dependent upon the shot that came before it and will affect the shot that comes after it. No shot exists by itself. This is the power of editing the two shots together create something completely different than either one independently. That's what we do. Thank God we're editors. We do that. Um, so the second concept is the one that Michael mentioned, and he promised you you would learn about it more tonight, and that's called the lean forward moment. And it builds on that concept. And basically, the, the, the concept behind this, and you can learn more about this at tworealguys.com. Uh, no one paid me for that promotional announcement. Just Keep moving, but you the pace is slowing down. That's right. I don't know about pace. I'm an editor. So what we do, uh, the, the, the concept of the lean forward moment is very simple. Audiences react when things change. They react when a piece of music is introduced where no music was there before. They react when we go from a wide shot to a close-up. They react when you have no sound and you had sound before. There's tons and tons of ways in which audiences can get involved in film, in a scene that you create. And at those moments where you go from cutting back and forth between um, medium shots, medium shots, medium shots, to a close up, that's when the audience inside will lean forward and pay a little bit more attention. And that's when you can deliver maximum message. If you look at any scene that you like to look at, whether it's in a commercial, a film, a scene in a film, a scene in a TV show, um, corporate video, doesn't matter. If you look at a scene that affects you in some way, you will find this happening, that there's a moment in that scene where something changes and you pay more attention. That's what I call the lean forward moment. One of the things that Norman taught me that, that I did not realize, at least consciously, is that something must change in order for a scene to be successful. If nothing changes, the scene isn't necessary. So somebody has to change an attitude or change an emotion, but there has to be change for the scene to work. And what Norman has done is to give that a name, which is the lean forward moment. What is the moment of change? Because that tells us where we can really drive home a particular point. Mm -hmm. And that's under our control. So once we understand what a scene is supposed to do, and I do that very simply by saying, usually asking these questions, whose scene is it, when you identify that, how does that person begin the scene, how does that person end the scene, I ask for adjectives, I can do that because I'm a professor. Uh, by the way, I was an editor for 20 plus years before Name that, so one I, film you worked on. Film I really like, a film called Heathers, I don't know how many of you know that film, but like. All right, name two films. Another film I like a lot is a film called, can I say, it? The Cotton Club, um, which is a Francis Coppola movie. Really, really like that. All right, that's enough. That's you've enough. you've, you've you. made okay. your point. Right. You've um, seen film. So, so uh, one of the things that uh, you'll look at is you will see that a character begins in one way, adjectives, ends another way, adjectives, and changes at some point or points in that scene. Another point that Norman made that I thought was a nice one, especially if you're starting out and struggling to figure out how to shape a scene, we're, we're gonna to get to that in a minute. But generally, the person that gets the first close-up is the focus of that scene. 
So if you're trying to figure out, when do I cut in tight? Ask yourself who that scene is about. And once you know who that scene is about, that tells you who gets the first close-up, and more than not, the last close-up as well. So you can drive home the fact that something about that particular person in that particular scene has changed. Absolutely, and where you determine to do that is within your control, hopefully, if you've got the footage to do it. Um, and that, um, that always comes from script, it always comes from story. This is what Google wanted to find out about and figure out the tools to do that. How do I shape story, not just how do I tech what I'm doing. So can we get to the film? Yeah, I think so. You have want we, to set it up? Have we delayed enough? Yeah, yeah we have. Michael is tapping his foot. Right, he's going like this. <clears throat> Uh, which is not as good as this, right? You know, there's uh, a reason people cut material out of scenes. That's right, and there's a reason why it's raw material <laughs> here. But Dean's going to cut this down, right, Dean? Thank you. All right, so uh, this is a USC thesis film that was done by an Indian student named Sham Balse. And um, most of our thesis films are done for reasonably decent budgets, anywhere from like seven, 8,000 up to... I don't know, 50,000, which is kind of a staggering amount of money to spend on a short film, in my mind. Um, this film was made relatively cheaply because it was made in India with all of his friends and family. Right? Um, so what this movie basically is about, and the reason why I mention the budget, is because this applies no matter what budget you're working at. Right? This is not just for big feature films. It's not just for network television shows. This is for any budget at all. So um, uh, what, what this film is about is about an uh, American, um, uh, an Indian who's emigrated to America when he fell in love with an American citizen. He came back to visit his father, who's incredibly traditional and was pissed off that he married an American woman. And while he was in Delhi, um, she accidentally was run over and killed. So now we cut to a short time later, and he is returned because his father is dying. And um, they, the movie basically fight, it shows them fighting between tradition and the new way, uh, between the father's religious beliefs and the son's rejection of all of that. Uh, so the scene we're about to take a look at comes after they have had their big final fight. And um, uh, Govinda runs out of the house, hops in a cab, and heads for the airport because he has had just enough of his dad. Um, and um, his dad has also just experienced, his wife has given him a, um, a picture of Govinda and Govinda's deceased wife and realizes that maybe he's been too harsh. So that's the setup for this scene, so why don't we take a look?
the ambulance. Let's get you inside. Babu. We're going to do this a little backwards here, right? The backwards part is we're beginning looking at a finished film and going to work backwards from there. In fact, what this filmmaker, Sham, had to do was to look at the script and figure out just what the hell the scene was about and then construct the scene to that. So we'll do it backwards for now, but I'm going to trust you're going to be able to reverse that and go forward from there, right? So um, what... What we do is, once again, ask those questions. So whose scene is this? It's Govinda's scene. Govinda's Govinda going, is him? Govinda is the young boy, and he is going through the change. He is figuring out that he can forgive his father, that he can maybe move a little bit across towards something he's rejected completely because it's his dad and because his dad is very doctrinaire about it. Right? So it's Govinda's scene. So how does he start the scene? What are some of the adjectives? He's angry. He's, he's non-conciliatory. Um, uh, he's uh, closed off. Uh, he's tight. How does he end the scene? He's open. He's uh, conciliatory. Uh, he's more accepting. And then you ask yourself, where does that change happen? Right? This is what we'll do from the script. Frankly, if you're a director, this is a tool not just for editors. This is a tool that I teach every filmmaker who comes through USC um, uh, and some across the world. I've taught this all over the world. Uh, and so this is incredibly valuable um, to determine what you shoot. I don't know how many of you have had this experience where you'll be ready to shoot. You've got 12 shots planned. You go there and you go like, holy crap. I only have an hour, so which six shots do I cut out? Which 10 shots do I cut out? You better cut out the ones that don't affect this ultimate outcome. You better cut out the shots knowing, rather than just solving a production problem, the ones that don't create post-production problems. And that comes from understanding the shape of the scene. So in fact, if you take a look, I would posit that the major moment in the scene where he undergoes the transition from being rejecting to accepting comes when he's face to face with the cow. Right? So the cow is a very totemic religious, um, uh, re religious symbol uh, in Hinduism and um, it's what his father has believed in. We've seen scenes earlier in the film with cows. We understand what that means to his dad and now he has to confront this cow who's blocking the cab. Uh, also, uh, the cow steps on a bracelet that he's been carrying that's his deceased wife's bracelet, uh, and then stares at him, right? So a number of things happen at the moment when he confronts the cow. We go from medium and wide shots to close-ups. The cow, by the time we end that scene, we're like this with the cow. We're also like this with Govinda. Right. Um, what are some other things that change? We go from a piece of music to quiet. So music changes. Sound effects also kind of sit. So there's big changes in our experience at that moment when he looks at the cow, has that close contact with the cow, and realizes that maybe the cow and his deceased wife are together in some way. And we feel that because so many things have changed at that moment, right? Um, music, sound, picture, the pacing changes as well. Pacing slows down. Um, so there's so many things that change at that moment that if you're paying attention to the film, which means you're not on your iPad, then um, after having the whole experience, this is a 22 minute film, and this comes at about 18 minutes, 17 minutes. Um, if you're paying attention to the film at that point, you're going to lean forward inside and pay a little bit more attention. Wow, something's different here. Wow, what's going on? And that's the moment when Sham delivered the message. Wow, being something goes on in his head, something, a light bulb goes on. I have to get back to my dad, who I left. Maybe he's dying. Yeah. Um, and so your involvement, in my mind, your involvement with the film changes at that moment. And it changes because of story. It changes because of script. Not because we understand what buttons to press 
in order to get to the close-up, but because we've up here chosen to go to the close-up, not, not earlier, but at that moment. So understanding what the story wants to do, let me, let me kind of draw you a little picture here. How do I know what moment to cut into that close-up? How do I know where to make that lean forward moment happen? I know it because I know what the scene wants to do, right? The scene wants to tell us that Govinda has had a change of heart. And how do I know that? Because I know what the whole damn movie wants to do. The movie wants to show us Govinda's arc from beginning where it's like, no way, I hate this, I'm coming back, I don't care about the, you know, I'm furious that I have to be here for my dad, and he makes even more furious and more furious, and then has this change. And then the rest of the movie comes from that. So this is a big moment of change in the movie. It's, it's a moment of change in the scene. That's the lean forward moment, and we get that because we've looked at story. There's no way to do this effectively without a story. Uh, in fact, if I could tell one side story, and then I'll, and I'll open it up. Um, there's this very cool experiment that I do in one of my classes. And uh, actually, someone in, uh, another professor in the uh, interactive media, the gaming division, does the same thing. I give my students a whole bunch of footage that was shot documentary style. And I ask half of them in the class, I say, you go and make up a story that this footage can work from and cut towards that story. Then I turn to another half of the students and I say, you avoid story at all cost. Figure out another way of cutting it. Cut for color, cut for movement. Do whatever you want, but don't do story. And this amazing thing happens when we come back the next week. Because they're all pretty talented people. It's why I took a two-thirds pay cut to go work at USC. <laughs> uh, and also because I'm insane. But, um, but you got a chair. I got a chair, which resulted in zero increase in money <laughs> for me. So, But no cushion. I want a cushion for that chair. Um, so uh, when we come back the next week, this is what we find out. So we look at the footage. We look at the cuts. And, you know, we, we cut on... Avid, premiere, final cut, doesn't matter. We cut in. The same thing happens. The people who constructed a story, the rest of the class looks at it and we get a story. For the other half of the class, who did not construct the story, the class looks at it and there's a story there anyway regardless of the fact that they work really hard to avoid a story. The brain, and there's plenty of neuroscience studies to back this up, the brain constructs story by the fact that images are put together. So if you cut together 50 images and one repeats, when that one repeats, the audience goes, wow, what did it repeat there? What's going on? Um, so there's no way to avoid story. So hell, wouldn't it be nice if we kind of take control of some of that story and let the audience feel the one we want? So all of these concepts together, there's no way to avoid a story. We can construct that rule of threes kind of thing. Um, we can construct lean forward moments, help the audience get that story. All of those things together make us more effective filmmakers. Frankly, it's why I think that the students who study story as opposed to technique or technical have a better job market out there than the ones who don't. Because everyone can listen to Larry Jordan's webinars and figure out how to do stuff. Um, pretty much anyone out there can underbid anyone else, so that way lies madness. So the real differentiator in my mind now is I can tell your story better than the next person. Why? Because I get story, I understand that. Google says we're storytellers, I say we're storytellers. Larry says we're storytellers, right? That's me handing it over to you. Larry does not necessarily agree with Norman's opinion all the time. <laughs> I think there's a balance. Uh, being filled with story and not knowing what buttons to push is a wonderful concept, but it doesn't get you paid. Uh, and I think that you need to balance storytelling, which Norman is heavily skewed toward, with <laughs> the ability to actually know what buttons to push to deliver the project on time. And that's my job, which is why Norman and I have such a wonderful time working together, because each of us figures the other guy's wrong. 
Um, no, I think you were both right. That's the awesome thing. What yeah. I want to do is I want to play this scene again, now that you've had a chance to inform the audience about what's going on. Give them four things, four things, oh, three things, four things. Give them four things to look at. So when we watch this again, what should we pay really close attention to? Mm -hmm. Okay, so great. What I want you to pay attention to are several things. Four things? Four things, okay. So um, uh, who gets the close-ups and when? And I want you to look especially around the moment that I think is the lean forward moment, though you'll be looking hopefully from the top at this. Uh, I want you to look at what happens with music there. Now there's a couple of places where music changes. Music changing is the beginning music and ending music is just a subset of music changing. So going from no music to music or going from one feel of music to another feel of music is music changing. And what did I say? Change is what attracts an audience. So there are a few places where music changes. On, and please look and notice them. On, and then another thing that I want you to take a look at is what happens after that lean forward moment where, um, where the audience is clear that he's begun to change. Govinda has changed. So once we kind of know that, then how, how much longer can you kind of withhold the scene where he says goodbye to his dad, where he actually reunites with his dad? So in fact, originally, that scene was much longer. He ran what seemed like all over India. It was like Gandhi, right? Um, uh, so when we were editing the film, where he, he and his editor were working on it, and I was just peanut gallery on the side, one of the things that they ended up deciding was, once that lean forward moment happened, to remove huge chunks of his run towards his dad. Why? Because we were ahead of the movie at that point. So it helps you with pacing when you take a look at this. So look at the balance of that scene. Um, things leading up to his change, things leading away from the change. I have no so idea if those are that's four. That's three, so we're looking to see who gets close-ups and when they occur. Mm -hmm. We're looking for when music changes. Right. When We're music looking changes. around the, the lean forward scene, which is the dialogue between the cow and Govinda. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at how short the scene is after he turns to run away before he sees his father. Mm -hmm. So those are the four things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I'd say. And you know what? You could look at other things, too. You could, you could look at your iPad. You can stop now. I may talk a little bit during this, sorry. So we're sad because they just had a fight. That's what the music is telling us. Now it changes. Medium and wide. changes. over. Now we go back to his dad and the decision is made. Music begins again.
Call the ambulance. Let's get you inside. Babu. Okay. It was interesting thinking about our dead body scene at the beginning, where the dead body where the dead body was placed informed how we viewed the scene. I was struck by the same thing here, Norman, where we see him running, and notice the father is standing, and we cut back to him running, and we come back to the father, and then the father has the attack. Mm -hmm. So we set that up. We could have easily just stayed with the father as he walked out the whole time, but by intercutting between the two, it built a stronger relationship between the two, to two men. Exactly right. Now, one of the subplots of the film is that the dad is waiting to die until the much delayed monsoon comes. So we know, because of that rule of threes, we know that now that the rain is here, he could die. So that's because information was given earlier. This, by the way, is major comedy material, not this. This is not comedy. But this is how we cut comedy also. We set something up, we set an expectation, then we pay it off, or don't pay it off. All right, so that there's lots of implications for genre in this as well. Now, the only time I ever mention the word genre is when I'm in a classroom as opposed to an editing room. But this is true. When I look back on my editing, uh, uh, on, on the editing I've done uh, as I'm teaching, I realize that I always had several reasons to make any cut that I ever did. And somehow it was wrapped up around this. So these are concepts I came up with to explain how I thought like an editor, not imposed from without, but coming from within. But many of the people in this room are not cutting features. Many of them are cutting corporates or cutting documentaries. Mm -hmm. This doesn't apply, does it? Hmm. Let me think if everything I've ever thought about is wrong. <laughs> no, of course not. That, uh, in fact, if you take a look, I just did a course for lynda.com based right around these concepts. And um, also in the Lean Forward moment, I go through documentaries. I, I use this very thing when I cut corporate videos as well. If I'm trying to convince someone to, let's say, buy a particular product, or if I'm a CEO and I'm trying to convince my board to do something, then I will establish a pattern. I will begin talking about it, and then when I get to the important point, I will change something. What did I change here? I changed the tone of my voice. I changed the pace of my voice. So listen, you're shooting. You may not get that performance from the CEO, but you can create some of that through use of B-roll, through use of um, uh, blowing up or changing sizes. There's so much that applies in these concepts, no matter what kind of material you are working on. Not just dramatic features, not just television, not just narrative. It applies to docs, it applies to uh, wedding and event videos, believe it or not. Um, it applies to corporate, it applies to every piece of media where you're trying to get your audience to feel something. And frankly, I'd say that's all media, all the time. One of the things we wanted to do tonight is to put a bookend around the evening. We started with some incredible technical discussions with Al Mooney showcasing the new features inside Premiere. And then we thought it would be worthwhile to come back and say, regardless of what editing software you're using, to show you what it is that you're editing and, the, and help reflect on some of the decisions that you're making in terms of how shots get put together and how music gets used. And to give you a, a chance to reflect on the craft as opposed to the technology of editing. We run the very real risk, if Norman and I sit up here much longer, of having the session run for about five and a half hours, which would exceed Mike's time, and the wine would run out, and people would be unhappy. But before Mike does right. throw we us off. We are the only thing between them and the raffle. I just so to we're going to let a couple questions come in, and then uh, Mike will turn it back to you. Yes, sir. The question is, uh, you mentioned the, the rule of threes several times. Can you show us a couple of examples of the one, two, three of the rule of threes as they apply? It isn't a one, two, three. Think of it differently. Look at this scene right here. What, when he is looking at the cow, okay, staring at the cow, that's shot one. We are on the tight shot of him. We're back to a tight shot of the cow. What we see in the cow is informed by the close-up of him looking at it. And the cow then inform the close-up of the cow then informs him looking back. 
The rule of threes is the juxtaposition of the shot before and the shot after, informing your interpretation mm -hmm. of the shot in the middle. It seems very much like the Hitchcock. Um, totally like that, right? You're talking about the bomb under the table? Yeah. yeah. So, so what you're referring to is something from the Hitchcock Truffaut book, um, in which Hitchcock said there's a major difference between having two people talking at a table, let's say us, and we talk for a while, and then the table blows up. Is the difference between that and having the two people talk at the table, showing a bomb underneath with a clock that says in three minutes it'll go off, and then cutting back up here. Once you establish that clock ticking down, then every single time we cut up to here talking, you the audience is going to be going like, oh my god, don't you get up from that table? Don't you realize that there's a bomb underneath it? What the hell is wrong with you? Right? So the impact of showing something underneath the table affects all the shots that come after it. That's what the rule of three concept is. Not precisely that there are three things, but shots are affected with what came before and will affect what comes after. Basically, the third shot can be the beginning of another three. Yes. So it can all enter. It is an endless progression. So in other words, every shot that you put in there is affected by the one that came before and will affect the one that comes afterwards. The one that comes afterwards becomes the shot that's affected by the one before and will affect the next shot. I think it's bad writing, actually. I think what Norman meant to say in what? his book what? What? before, if he would have just sent it off to editorial <laughs> control. Moving along to the next question. What, what Norman is saying is that the shot that you see changes your interpretation of the shot you're going to see. Don't get hung up on the pattern of threes. It's just that every shot informs the next shot, informs the next shot. Mm -hmm. Right, and by the way, the side to that is every scene is affected by the scene that came before and will affect the scene that comes afterwards. So the way you end a scene, the way you end a segment, you know, when I cut docs, I'll often have three by five index cards that break the film down into sections. I don't know if you do that as well, but I certainly do. The feeling that I end one section with will totally inform the feeling of that next section. There's four really short cuts of him running, but they're different angles, of, or not different angles, but they're different distances. Now, I, I don't know what you like to make of it other than I was thinking, well, if you just showed one shot and I'm tying the ground with the test, maybe that was a compression of time. How would you? Well, I can tell you from having been there that it was a number of factors. One is the director just truly didn't want to cut it down any further, but that I would also take a look at the shots that surround him running. So they're kids playing and being happy. So it was very important to the filmmaker to move into a new section where what's surrounding Govinda, the sun, is happy. So. He felt, after looking at it a number of times, that um, wasn't sufficed by one or two shots. It needed more to change the attitude of the audience around that, not after the lean forward moment. Yes, sir. The one thing that, uh, I don't know whether he got this shot or he didn't get it, but the, the necklace or the, the brooch on the ground, I mean, at the first time I saw it, I didn't even know what it was. Mm -hmm. And so, um, did he just miss getting that covered? Well, um, no, he didn't actually, because what you didn't see is the first 12 minutes of the film. And in fact, in a perfect example of the rule of threes, because that bracelet was shown several times earlier in the film in great detail, he didn't need to show it as much here. So you got it, you knew what it was, because you'd seen it several times before in the film. So that's a great example. Uh, they end up in many different places, actually. Many of them um, uh, go back to the countries or places that they came from and have careers there. A large number of them uh, actually end up getting work here in Los Angeles. We are huge in reality TV. Some whole shops are SC shops. Um, uh, there are large numbers of editors, assistant editors, who are working in features in television, who are alumni from us. Uh, and there are a number who have established careers, and there's one who's making Boku coin at uh, wedding videos right now. 
Uh, there are people who are doing all kinds of things. It depends what they want to do. Many of them are doing docs. It's, it's whatever you want. All the way across. I think that's a great point, actually. Did, did we all hear that? No. Um, so so um, the point was is that in the running, there were several shots of him running in mediums and from different angles and all. And then there was one of his feet running. Right there. Um, uh, and uh, here was the thought behind this. You notice it's the last one of him that you see before we cut to him arriving at the house. Um, and because he had established a pattern of those medium shots from different angle and then goes to something very different, you feel it more. That's the concept of change. So he knew that the audience would feel differently right before he arrives at his dad because he changed the kind of shot. So that's what he was working with. Um, and some of this stuff, by the way, is just inside. Editors feel they do it subconsciously, unconsciously. But our job is to do consciously what audiences react to subconsciously.